Και τώρα με μεγάλη χαρά θα, θα ήθελα να σας παρουσιάσω το φίλο μου και χωριανό μου τον κύριο Τσιμίκα. Ε, γιατί ό, όλοι οι άνθρωποι ε, με τον οποίο τον βλέπω αρκετά τακτικά τα καλοκαίρια και θα, βέβαια τώρα θα τον δούμε από την άλλη μεριά της Καλιφόρνιας και που είχα τη μεγάλη χαρά και τιμή να κάνουμε μαζί και να συνεργαστούμε σε μια πάρα πολύ ωραία μελέτη η οποία έχει να κάνει με αυτά τα οποία φαντάζομαι θα μας πει και σήμερα την Ιωάννα Στάντη. Ε, κύριε Τσιμίκα, έχετε το λόγο. Dr. Soterio Tsimikas, and I am pleased to provide this lecture for the 41st Panhellenic Congress of Cardiology. The lecture is entitled Antisense Therapeutics for Lipid Disorders of Clinical Unmet Needs. I am Professor of Medicine in the Division of Cardiology at the University of California, San Diego. These are my disclosures. Lipoproteins genetically associated with cardiovascular risk and amenable as targets with RNA therapeutics are shown here. These include LDL ApoB, ApoLipoprotein A of LPA, ApoC3, and angiopoietin like 3. The LDL ApoB component is very, very well uh, understood, and therefore I will focus on LPA, ApoC3, and angiopoietin like 3 today. This field is relatively new, but there is significant interest in its progression to clinical medicine. These are key publications using antisense oligonucleotides that have been published on ApoC3 and in like 3 and ApoA since 2014. I would like to have, uh, have a brief review of uh, the types of RNA therapeutics so that everybody is understanding of the differences in these compounds. I will mainly speak about antisense oligonucleotides today. These are single-stranded DNA molecules and they have multiple mechanisms of uh, therapeutic effect. And I will describe one specific one today. Now, naked DNA does not work well as a pharmaceutical agent because it's rapidly degraded. Therefore, for these to become drugs, they have to be modified both in the phosphate backbone as well as in the ribose ring. Importantly, as I mentioned, these are single-stranded molecules, and therefore they can be injected and they will, they will travel to their site of activity without any carrier. SIRNA is another form. This is small inhibiting RNA. And now this is RNA instead of DNA. Uh, it's also uh, modified, but importantly, it differs from antisense in that it is a double-stranded molecule and uses a specific mechanism called the risk mechanism uh, to have its therapeutic effect. There's a third type of uh, therapeutic, which is aptamers, and these can be both RNA and DNA, and these target proteins instead of targeting mRNA. Now, if this is a relatively new field. These are the approved RNA drugs by regulatory agencies. Notice here, there are only four companies that have produced these drugs, and there are uh, just a handful of drugs currently approved. In the cardiovascular area, I want to point out that for homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia, kinamro or mepamersum was approved. For familial chylomicronemia syndrome, Boilevra or Verlanosaurus has been approved in the EU. And now there's quite a bit of work on TTR MLA doses in cardiomyopathy by both Ionis and Alnylam. Now, a large improvement in this field has been the ability to target these molecules to the liver. And this is something, this is done by something called GALNEC or N-acetyl galactosamine. These are three galactose sugars uh, that are modified and they're complexed on with some ligands into onto the antisense molecule. Galactosamine is, accumulates on proteins and is a signal to the liver to remove these proteins because they've been circulating for too long. You can add this galactosamine to your antisense molecules and when they travel to the liver, the liver will treat them like an old protein. And therefore, 
through this acyl like a protein receptor that you see here, the galnic is uh, bound, it's internalized, and once it's internalized, the galnic is cleaved off, the antisense molecule does, goes into the nucleus. The way uh, it achieves its therapeutic efficacy is that it finds its target messenger RNA, it forms an ASO mRNA duplex. And of course, these duplexes do not exist in nature. And therefore, every cell has an enzyme, a nuclease called ribonuclease H1, that finds these and cleaves the sense strands so you can no longer make protein, but leaves behind the drug or the antisense strand. And this can then go back and find to another molecule. For this reason, this is a elegant mechanism and also a specific mechanism that preserves the ability to uh, for the liver to function otherwise, but only affect that one particular mRNA. Now, if you add the galnic onto your compound, uh, what it basically does is it increases the potency approximately 20 to 30 fold. And these are compounds without the galnic, and these are compounds with the galnic. This is a dose response curve. This is human data and clinical trials. You see here, this is the dose in a log scale, and this is the target reduction. So to achieve a 50% reduction, or ED50, for the LPA antisense molecule, you go from 122 milligrams out here to 4 milligrams out here. And so you can increase the potency 30-fold. Increasing the potency has tremendous advantages for a variety of reasons, including safety and tolerability. Now, let's review lipoprotein little a first. Uh, as I think most of you know, this is a genetic risk factor, and the levels are not affected by diet or by uh, other environmental factors significantly. It actually is composed of two uh, proteins, ApoB100 and ApoA, and ApoA is covalently bound to ApoB100. The ApoA component is actually not a lipoprotein because it has no lipid on it, unlike ApoB, which is full of lipid. Importantly, there are oxidase phospholipids on the uh, lipid phase as well as covalently bound to the ApoA. And we believe that LPA is atherogenic through three mechanisms, atherogenicity through its LDL component, antifibrinolytic activity through its ApoA component, and pro-inflammatory effects through its oxidase phospholipids. It has two major phenotypes, cardiovascular disease, vascular disease, and aortic stenosis, and currently there are no approved pharmacological therapies. LP little a was first described by Carrie Berg from Oslo, Norway in 1963. And as I mentioned earlier, it has multiple Kringles, but, uh, and it is derived from the plasminogen gene, but is only derived from Kringle 4 and 5 from the plasminogen gene and has an inactive protease domain unlike plasminogen. Now, Kringle 4, through evolution, duplicated itself multiple times, and there are actually 10 subtypes, one of which, Kringle 4 type 2, is present anywhere from 1 to 40 copies, and therefore, this uh, LP is highly polymorphic in having um, over 40 different isoforms. In cardiovascular disease, it causes coronary artery disease, stroke, peripheral arterial disease, heart failure through uh, myocardial infarction, kidney disease, and aortic stenosis. And notice here that aortic stenosis is, is a fairly large component of its clinical phenotype. Now, the plasma levels are primarily related to how much is synthesized in the liver on a daily basis. There are several clearance mechanisms, but these are secondary and that the production is really mediated by the genetics uh, that were inherited from each parent. Now, this is a very prevalent, highly prevalent risk factor. This is data from the U.S., but the EU data is very similar. This is a large laboratory database. This is the first LPA level uh, from each one of these patients. And note here uh, that levels of 60 milligrams per deciliter, which are twice normal, are present in 20% of this population. And so for the EU, this would be 150 million people, and globally, uh, it would be plus or minus 1.4 billion. 
Now, there are strong evidence epidemiologically and genetically for this being a risk factor in people without prior therapy. This is a very large meta-analysis of 1.3 million years of follow-up. And notice here that the risk is fairly flat until you get to about 30 milligrams per deciliter, then it rises linearly. Mendelian randomization using the instrument of Kringle 4 type 2 repeats has very similar uh, data as well, the, as well as SNPs. The more SNPs you have that are associated with higher LPA levels, the higher risk you have of coronary artery disease. So you might ask, well, what about patients on statins and what about patients on PCSK9 inhibitors? LP little a remains a risk factor in those. This is our work, 29,000 patient meta-analysis with individual data. Note here, a linear relationship again to risk once you get about 30 milligrams per deciliter. This is data from the Odyssey Outcomes trial in all baseline samples. The quartiles of LPA, the highest quartile here is 60. So in this case, these patients have CAD, actually 25% of the patients have twice normal values. And again, notice this linear relationship to cardiovascular risk, depending on which uh, endpoint you look at. Now, we have been very interested in aortic stenosis and LP little a. Uh, George Thanasoulis was the, and his group was the first to report the genetics. We've now linked the oxidized phospholipid component to the procalcifying key entity on LPA that seems to trigger aortic stenosis. I'm not going to review this uh, in this talk, except to point out that there's a lot of work being done in this area. Now, what about patients that we see every day in the cath lab? This is one of my patients. You see here has a very bulky atheroma and the cephalus rain graft to the circumflex. And this is what it looks like uh, after this has been stented. A very nice result. And of course, uh, these patients uh, often will uh, have distal embolic uh, debris. And this was captured by a distal embolic device. And then we took this back to our laboratory, did mass spectroscopy and note here, the oxidized phospholipid signature that's emanating from this bulky atheroma. In a different patient that unfortunately died, this is a very large fibroatheroma. Note here the brown stain is LPA, the red stain is oxidized, phospholip oxidized LDL, and the uh, brown stain here is oxidized phospholipid, highly, highly prevalent in these lesions. Now, oxidized phospholipids are predictive of cardiovascular outcomes. This is now uh, that you see here nine studies that have comparison of the third or fourth uh, group compared to the first in terms of quartiles or tertiles and the hazard ratios compared. And notice here the hazard ratios are fairly robust, particularly for stroke, uh, over two in many of these studies. Uh, and so this is a very potent predictor of cardiovascular disease and events in people without prior CVD and people with, with prior CVD. Now, this test was developed in our laboratory and it's now clinically available as of March 2020. We are now working on having this available for Greece and Dr. Tselepis has expressed interest and we will... Um, work to uh, place an instrument and the kits that go with this in his laboratory in the University of Iwanina so that this could be a center for referral for patients uh, and physicians that are interested in having this uh, risk predictor measured. Now, what about guidelines? Uh, this is the ESCAS guidelines, very important, a new step in this field. There are now six guidelines that recommend testing but the EAS, ESC in particular, uh, was the most forward-looking and suggested that every single adult have an LPA level at least once to find patients that have very high levels that would have a lifetime equivalent risk, typical of familial hypercholesterolemia. Okay, now let's review the most recent study. There's been four trials uh, with Pelicarsin, which is the generic name. The most recent name for it was Exia APOA LRX. This is the design and endpoints. Uh, this drug is now actually uh, owned by Novartis and they're taking uh, going forward with all the new clinical development. This is patients that had LP little a greater than 60 milligrams per deciliter, prior history of cardiovascular disease, randomized to these five groups 
treat it for six to 12 months. And then the primary endpoint was uh, LP little a levels, uh, the change, the mean percent change from baseline to six months. And then there were secondary endpoints that I'll describe in a minute. This is the key finding of the study. This is the pool placebo group. Note a dose dependent reduction in LP little a. And note here uh, that the 20 milligram every week, equivalent to 80 milligrams a month, uh, caused an 80% mean reduction. And we had several patients that had more than 99% reduction in LP little a. So this is approximately three times more potent than what's currently available for lowering LPA. Now, a second important finding was that 98% of patients reached goal of less than 50 milligrams per deciliter. So that not only is a very potent drug, and uh, it gets basically everybody to a non-atherogenic goal. And so this combination of findings will allow us to very nicely address the LP hypothesis because we're gonna start with high levels. Everybody then will be down to normal, essentially. And then the question will be, do they get a clinical benefit? So it will be a very clean uh, way to interpret whether LPA lowering uh, to our normal level uh, leads to improved cardiovascular endpoints. Now, importantly, because oxidized phospholipids are carried by both ApoB and ApoA, these are markedly reduced. This is the absolute data. Now, also importantly, both LDL cholesterol and ApoB are reduced at a level that you see with azetamide. And so absolute reduction is about 16 and 10 milligrams per deciliter. Percent reduction is up to 23 milligrams per deciliter. So uh, what that basically means is that you will have a benefit in lowering LPA, but also in oxidized phospholipids, but also in LDL and ApoB. Now the drug itself does not affect LDL or ApoB directly. In other words, it doesn't affect synthesis. And we think what is happening is LPA car particles clear slow. When you no longer can make them, the remaining LDL can clear a day faster. In other words, the LDL that would have been destined to be LPA and clear slow now can clear faster. And because of that, you have a reduction. So in these studies, despite these patients being on 90% being on statins, 50% being on azetamide, and 20% being on PCSK9 inhibitors, they continue to have additional LDL and ApoB lowering on top of that very, very potent baseline therapy. So what we expect in the Horizons trial, which is the phase three cardiovascular outcomes trial is this. Patients will have cardiovascular disease with a prior history of MI, stroke, or PAD. They will have LPA level over 70 that you see here in the red. They will then be given pelicarsin 80 milligrams versus placebo. They should move from the red to the green, i.e. in the normal range. And then the two co-primary endpoints will be evaluated, LP little a greater than 70 and LP little a greater than 90, either one of which uh, will be considered a positive trial if it's statistically significant. This study, uh, I believe, is like 4S was uh, in the early 90s. That is the large trial. It's well-powered. It's going to go for a median follow-up of 4.2 years, a minimal follow-up in every single patient of 2.5 years, 993 events, and should be the definitive trial uh, for this LPA hypothesis. Okay, uh, let me now switch to APOC3. APOC3 is uh, involved in triglyceride metabolism. It's a small lipoprotein made in the liver. It regulates all triglyceride-rich lipoproteins through two mechanisms. One, it inhibits clearance, so it allows them to accumulate. And it inhibits lipoprotein lipase, so you cannot break down triglycerides into free fatty acids. And these two things lead to chylomicronemia from the diet and also more garden variety elevated uh, uh, triglycerides through liver output. Now, studies have shown that both plasma levels of APOC3 as well as mutations that lead to lower levels of APOC3 are associated with reduced triglyceride levels and a significant reduction in cardiovascular disease events. Now, if you have this situation here and you have chylomicronemia, those patients tend to get pancreatitis. These patients that have VLDL abnormalities, IDL, remnant cholesterol, tend to get uh, cardiovascular disease. 
Now I'm going to review for you two trials uh, for one trial for this study for this drug, and then one trial for angiopoint like three next. Uh, this was presented by Dr. Tardif at the ESC. This is a phase two trial. A note here: the doses uh, there could be weekly, every two weeks, or every every four weeks. Similar design as before: six to twelve months of follow of treatment, and then some follow up. In this case, the primary endpoint is fasting triglycerides, and there's additional secondary endpoints that I'll review. This is the primary endpoint of this trial. Placebo trended up, not significantly, and you see here dose-dependent reduction, up to 60% reduction in triglycerides, which is approximately twice what is currently achievable with uh, available drugs. Now, the secondary endpoints uh, all trended in the right direction. A plus C3, as expected, was significantly reduced in the mid to high 70s. VLDL cholesterol as much as 60% reduction. Non-HDL cholesterol reduced. Uh, no change in LDL. Uh, trend towards ApoB reduction in a couple of the doses and two of the doses that were statistically significant. And then there were increases in uh, HDL and ApoA1. Now, the other important part of the study is 91% of the patients achieved fasting triglyceride levels of 150 with the highest dose. So again, these drugs are very potent, get most people to where you need to get them, and uh, would, would be able to uh, test very cleanly any hypothesis in a phase three trial. Now, because chylar micronemia is associated with pancreatitis and affects young patients, the first step in the development of this is to do a study uh, in familial chylar micronemia syndrome and this will ultimately replace Waylibra, which is approved in Europe. Following this, additional indications are being considered that are broader in patients that have multifactorial chylomicronemia, triglycerides over 500, and more modest elevations of triglycerides that you see here. Okay, to finish up, angiopoietin like three. This is another important regulator of triglycerides and cholesterol. However, this also regulates LDL as well as triglycerides, and it does that through a couple of mechanisms. One is it inhibits lipoprotein lipase, like APOC3, but importantly, it also induces liver output of VLDL. And so if you have high levels of angiopoint like 3, the liver puts out more VLDL, and then it cannot break it down. You can think of this as a starvation molecule, and that the levels are increased when you need to actually put out more energy to the periphery. However, if you're not starving, uh, this is end up being uh, detrimental in a cardiovascular sense. Now, patients have complete loss of function of these, of angiopoint like three, have low HDL, LDL, and triglycerides. So all three of those particles are reduced, but they also have low risk of coronary artery disease. Now, we just finished a phase two trial. Uh, Daniel Gaudet was the first author. This was published in the European Heart Journal in conjunction with the ESC meeting. This one had four groups, three, three treated groups and a placebo. Very similar uh, study design, including the primary endpoint being fasting triglycerides. This one though was very difficult to treat patients. They have to have three things. And so this wasn't necessarily designed to test the CAD hypothesis, but it looked at two other aspects of metabolism. So it had to have, the patients had to have all three of these, fasting triglycerides over 150 or 1 1.7 millimoles, type 2 diabetes, and hepatic steatosis. So all these criteria had to be met, and then they were randomized in the study. So note here, these are middle-aged patients. They have a BMI that's elevated. They have hemoglobin A1C that's elevated, and they have a hepatic fat fraction of 17.6%, and triglyceride levels of about 3.65 millimoles, uh, which is over 300 in, in, in milligrams per deciliter. This is the primary endpoint. Uh, somewhere between 53 and 47% reduction, depending on which dose uh, was evaluated. And so highly statistically significant. And then all of the secondary endpoints are going in the right direction. Angel, angel point like three, total cholesterol, VLDL, non-HDL cholesterol, ApoB, uh, and ApoC3, importantly, actually was also significantly reduced, probably through a secondary clearance mechanism. So this drug is licensed to Pfizer and Pfizer is currently conducting a phase 2B study, uh, and this will actually now choose the dose for a very large, over 10,000 patient cardiovascular outcome trial uh, 
in patients that have mixed dyslipidemia, i.e. continued high LDL and high triglyceride levels. So in conclusion, antisense oligonucleotides are ideally suited to treat elevated LDL, LDL elevated levels of LP little a, APOC3, and angel point like 3. Phase 3 trials have been initiated or will start in late 2000, early 2021, and reducing levels of LPA, remnant cholesterol, and LDL and triglycerides in mixed dyslipidemias has a potential to further reduce residual cardiovascular risk and improve prognosis. So with that, I would like to thank a very large number of people that were involved in all of these trials at Ionis, Axia, Novartis, Pfizer, as well as many of my academic collaborators. Efkaristopoli. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Chimikas, for your interesting uh, presentation. My question is, too many drugs for the lipids. We have uh, statins, we have azatimibe, we have now PCSK9 in, uh, with uh, RNA inter interference. Uh, we have now for the LPA, other for, uh, for others for triglycerides. Uh, how many of for these uh, drugs is possible to take one patient together? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, well, um, you know, if you, if you look at the patient outcomes, there's still a residual risk. And although I think for the most part, you know, except for homozygous FH, we can control LDL. The other risk factors as, that, that you mentioned are not controlled. And so we will need drugs to lower triglycerides and LPA. And the question is which one or which ones will be the best ones to do that? Um, you know, at some point you can argue maybe to have combination therapies with these injectables that could happen. Uh, but the bottom line is we can probably get everybody's LDL to 50, triglyceride to 50, and LPA to 50 or less. And if we do that, I think the cardiovascular risk will be markedly diminished. Uh, and so that would be the ultimate goal is to have the tools in the physician's hands to choose from a variety of these drugs to get our optimal risk reduction. And so how that plays out ultimately in the next 10 years, we'll have to wait and see. Uh, we have uh, pro Professor, the, the President Gudevenos, John Gudevenos. Okay. Hi, John. Sorry, I don't think your microphone is on. Hi, it's on. So, okay. what, what, good morning. what time is there now? Uh, it's 4, 4.21 in the morning. Too early, but it, it looks like <laughs> starting working. <laughs> so this is like being on call. I was putting the rotis in the Greek. I had the impression that all of that the LPA that you talk about, all of that is the cholesterol. And this is the problem. The pharma and the LPA are going to be reduced. I had the impression that they increase the cholesterol. All the tablets about for LPA, small LPA, little LPA. How things are now? Yeah. Okay. So here's the problem with uh, that. I, I think um, the issue is when you uh, inhibit the APOA molecule in the liver, the liver can still make VLDL and LDL and, and, and send it out. And so the idea is that when you have the same number of APOB particles and now you get rid of L APO B, uh, APOA, you, it may look like you have more LDL, uh, but the number of APOB particles, if anything, will be lower because of this clearance mechanism I mentioned. The issue with, with those measurements is that, as you may know, the current laboratory ways to measure LDL include the LPA cholesterol in there. And so it, it's a little bit difficult to interpret what exactly is happening to the LDL. I can tell you this, that we have developed a new method to separate the LPA from the LDL particles and get a more accurate LDL. And we're not doing that in this phase two study I just showed you. And there's actually no effect on the real LDL with these antisense oligonucleotides. And so it's actually not going up. If anything, it's going down because of the uh, clearance mechanism. So I think what you'll see is when we do the large trial, this will be validated and the drug will have three effects all going in the right direction, lower LPA, lower oxidized phospholipids, and lower APOB. And so it really would be a very interesting um, 
test of the hypothesis and we should be able to see how much benefit that leads to uh, in the trial. Thank you very much again. At, uh, we will see soon in Greece, uh, hopefully the next year. Bye-bye, Sam. Bye, Sam. Yes, sir. Yes, sir.